there's a lot more to light than meets the eye. There can be no observation without a corresponding selection process. To observe everything is to observe nothing. To observe something is to filter out everything else. According to the supervelocity and selection theory of light, there is some selection process which begins with latent light and ends with observable light. Whether or not light ever becomes observable to a particular observer depends in part on the distance of that light from the observer in velocity space. And it is that special distance between the observer and the observable light in velocity space that we recognize as the speed of light. Also according to the supervelocity and selection theory of light, observation depends on a causal interaction. The main rule for causal interaction with respect to matter is that two objects must occupy the same location in space and the same location in time in order to interact. But in order for light to causally interact with matter, there is an additional rule that must also be satisfied. In order for an interaction to take place, light and matter must be in the same location in space and be in the same location in time and also be separated by a distance of c in velocity space. If all three of these conditions are not met, then no causal interaction takes place. I understand why what I have just said would be difficult to understand, and that is really the point of this video. My goal here is to make this easier to understand. So what is latent light and what is manifest light? If you can't explain it to a six-year-old, then you don't understand it yourself. This quote is normally attributed to Albert Einstein, and Richard Feynman has also said something similar. But what matters most is not who said it, but what they meant by it. If you can't explain it to a six-year-old, then you don't understand it yourself. I think that this quote is apt because the gradual encroachment of sophistry and obscurantism is a pernicious problem in physics in particular, and in science more generally. When I explain the supervelocity and selection theory of light to ordinary people, it normally takes me about two minutes, and most people actually get it almost immediately. I will typically say something like this. You know how a rainbow looks like it's in a certain place, but if you move, the rainbow appears to move too? Which means that the rainbow was never really in that place? Well, the rainbow isn't really anywhere, and the speed of light works in exactly the same way. We know that light has to move at a certain speed, but relative to what? As it turns out, the answer is relative to you. That means that if you change your speed, then light also has to adjust its speed accordingly so that it can appear to maintain a constant speed relative to you. This of course is hard to believe, and this is why Einstein came up with the idea that time has to slow down and space has to shrink in a relative way in order for a relative speed of light to stay the same. Einstein called these effects time dilation and length contraction, but I say that this is the wrong explanation, because it is based on the assumption that the speed of light has already been determined before it has been observed. My idea is that light actually travels at all speeds and in all directions at the same time, but we can't see all of it. We can only see the light that moved in a particular direction and at a particular speed. In order to see light, it needs to interact with you, which means that it needs to be directed at your pupil, but it also needs to move at a certain speed relative to you. So your physical location determines which light you can see, but so does the speed and direction that you're moving in. This is how the observer selects the light that they can see, through being in a certain location in space, and also through being in a certain location in what I call velocity space. In order to explain how light can move at multiple speeds at the same time, I just borrow the idea of quantum superposition from quantum mechanics, and I apply it to the speed of light. Light really moves at multiple speeds, but you can only see light move at one speed at a time. 
it is the observer that selects the speed of the light that they observe. As I've said, most people have no trouble with understanding the theory when I put it like that. The only people who appear to struggle to understand the supervelocity and selection theory of light are physicists and other physics nerds. As it pertains to their comprehension, Murphy's Law appears to apply. Anything that can be misunderstood will be misunderstood. I think that ultimately, the incomprehension boils down to a lack of motivation. A significant minority of physics enthusiasts really do not want to understand this theory. As they say, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Unfortunately, if you try to understand a new theory, there is always a risk that you may fail. But if you try really hard to not understand a new theory, then you're guaranteed to succeed in your efforts. So it seems as though many people are actually quite risk averse, and they're not really interested in a challenge. Rather than to put any effort into understanding the theory, many self-identified nerds would rather argue endlessly about semantics. What should the term theory denote? Which connotation should it have? I don't know how, I don't know why, and I don't know exactly when, but apparently the definitions of theory and of hypothesis have both been changed quite radically and quite recently. That in itself is concerning, but really, this is all just a distraction. This is but one of many available excuses that people can supply, which permits them to avoid the hard work of thinking. If understanding the supervelocity and selection theory of light is akin to finding your way through a maze, where every choice that you make is an assumption, then those who are already intimately familiar with special relativity are beginning with a huge disadvantage. They have already found themselves at a dead end, and they must now retrace their steps and find their way all the way back to where they started. Why? Because they've already taken several wrong turns in order to get to where they are now. The more accustomed you are to thinking in terms of space-time, the more difficult it will be to think in terms of velocity space. At this point, those who are trained to think in space-time will need to think very carefully about their assumptions, which will have already become automatic, and they will need to unlearn much of what they've already learned, and this places a huge cognitive burden on them. Fortunately, the general public does not have this additional burden to contend with. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. The reason that I make such long and detailed arguments in the book and in these videos is mainly for the benefit of physicists and engineers. I want to ensure that I address most of the objections and misunderstandings that might arise. New concepts are understandably difficult to grasp at first, and latent light is probably the most important concept to get a handle on. The supervelocity and selection theory of light depends critically on a distinction that is drawn between what I call latent light and manifest light. Simply put, latent light is all of the light that exists, while manifest light is only the light that can be seen from some specific location in velocity space. Latent and manifest light are both equally real, but manifest light is just the tip of the iceberg, while latent light is the entire iceberg. The convoluted aspects of special relativity are partly a result of an overgeneralization from what we know about manifest light to light in general. In other words, there is a failure to comprehend and account for the hidden dynamics of manifest and latent light. To return to the rainbow analogy, the rainbow appears to be in a certain location. We can see the rainbow, we can point to the rainbow, and we can take a picture of the rainbow. But the rainbow that we see is really only the tip of the iceberg. In reality, the rainbow is both everywhere and nowhere at the same time. But in order to understand the fact that the rainbow is actually everywhere and nowhere, we need to be able to stand in different locations and compare our observations. The rainbow that we do see is akin to the manifest light. All of the rainbows that could potentially be seen are akin to latent light.
The latent light is everywhere, but nowhere in particular, whereas the manifest light is somewhere, or at least it appears to be. Unfortunately, it is very difficult for us to apply our intuition in order to achieve an understanding of the speed of light and of the structure of velocity space. In order to see depth, we use binocular vision. Binocular depth perception is made possible due to the fact that we have two eyes, which are about two inches apart. Our mind integrates the information that we gather from both eyes in order to construct a three-dimensional representation of our environment. Through integrating two perspectives, we arrive at a more objective understanding. However, if we wanted to use binocular vision to see depth in velocity space, then our two eyes would need to be moving relative to one another at an extreme speed. If this could be accomplished, then we could occupy two different inertial frames of reference at one time. Because this is impossible, our perception is necessarily limited to only one perspective at a time in velocity space. But this limitation doesn't prevent us from using our imagination to map out and integrate perspectives. It just means that we don't have an intuitive grasp of velocity space because we don't have any capacity for depth perception in velocity space. If humans did evolve to have binocular vision in velocity space, then it would not be necessary to explain the supervelocity and selection theory of light to anyone. We would just already understand it intuitively. In order to bridge this gap in understanding, and to make the theory more intuitive, I need to explain how this concept connects with other concepts which we are already familiar with. One of these concepts is superposition in quantum mechanics, where probabilities are assigned to various discrete states. And the other is the Huygens-Fresnel principle in optics, which describes how light waves spread out in all directions at the same time. In all cases, what we begin with prior to observation is relatively broad, but what is actually observed is relatively narrow. Think about shining a light onto a special photosensitive screen. This special screen is so sensitive that it can record the impact of individual photons by amplifying and sustaining a chemical reaction that is sparked by the impact of a single photon with a single molecule. The environment that this special screen is stored in is also kept incredibly dark. So rather than containing trillions of photons flying around in all directions, this environment can contain no photons or just one photon at a time. Even though we cannot see individual photons directly, the properties of this screen allow us to see precisely where each individual photon has landed on the screen. According to the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, the light travels as a wave towards the screen, but at some point before the light interacts with the screen, the wave collapses into a point-like particle, and it interacts with only one tiny molecule at a time. All of the wave's energy is then transferred to that one tiny spot on the screen, and this interaction leaves a permanent and visible mark on the screen. In this case, the wave is the latent light, and the specific location where the photon interacts with the screen is the manifest light. The continuous wave is latent light, and the discrete particle is manifest light. Prior to the interaction, we have a wave of potential positions where the energy of the wave could be absorbed, and after the interaction, we have an actual position where the energy of the wave is actually absorbed. However, what we are calling a position here is actually better understood as a direction. I say this because in order for a particle to leave from the light source and to land at a particular location on the screen, it's reasonable to assume that it needed to move in a particular direction. The path taken by the light needs to have had a single, narrowly defined direction. But the direction of the path taken by the light is not determined until after the interaction takes place. And when it is finally determined, it appears to be determined randomly. This is what is so strange about quantum mechanics. A picture of reality begins to emerge from the study of quantum mechanics 
which seems to suggest that reality is impressionistic, like Monet, and improvisational, like jazz music. The tiny details don't make sense, and they are unpredictable, but in the end, they also don't really matter. But I digress. It is the different directions of the path taken by the photon that ultimately lead to the different positions of its interaction with the screen. In other words, a wave is like a particle except that it travels in a super direction, whereas a particle can only travel in one particular direction at a time. Energy can be transmitted either through a wave or through a particle. As a wave expands, its amplitude spreads out over a larger and larger area, and so while the total energy of the entire wave remains constant, this energy becomes progressively weaker as it is spread more thinly over a larger area. With particles, energy is also conserved, because the momentum that is carried by each particle remains the same. But as the particles spread out, the distances between them increase, and so the total energy per unit of area also decreases. In either case, what you end up with is a fixed quantity of energy which remains constant while the total area that we are considering increases, and so the intensity of the energy decreases as the distance from the source increases. And so the overall effect is remarkably similar. When we model light as a particle, we talk about the momentum carried by individual particles and about the spacing between the particles. When we model light as a wave, we can talk about the amplitude or the frequency of the wave. But light is somehow both a particle and a wave, and also neither a particle nor a wave. According to the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, the direction of the path taken by the photon is determined randomly, but only after the interaction with the screen has already taken place. It is as though what has already happened in the past is decided at some point in the future, and this is very hard to swallow. According to the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, the wave function of the photon never actually collapses. In other words, no decision is ever made about which direction the photon took, or where it landed on the screen. Instead, what happens is that the observer actually splits into multiple observers who each observe the same interaction but from a different perspective. One observer will then see the photon move in one direction, and another observer will see the same photon move in a different direction. This splitting process is akin to how a cell may divide into two identical copies of itself. Once the split has occurred, these multiple observers cannot interact with each other because they each occupy different, self-contained universes, and these universes are all essentially identical copies of one another. All of these universes exist simultaneously, but because they do not interact with each other, there is no possible way to detect them or to confirm their existence. Now if you find this many worlds explanation difficult to accept, then welcome to the club. Under this interpretation, the direction of the path of the photon is not determined randomly at the moment of interaction. Instead, it's the identity of the observer that is determined randomly. But then the question just becomes, how is it determined which of these multiple observers will end up being you? One could say that all of these observers are actually you, just different versions of you and in different universes. But then how is it decided which of these universes you will occupy? There is still an element of randomness and arbitrariness which the many worlds interpretation leaves unresolved. According to the pilot wave interpretation of quantum mechanics, light waves and photons exist simultaneously, and the photons ride the waves just like tiny surfers. The wave function never collapses according to this interpretation. Rather, the waves determine where the particles go, and the particles directly interact with the screen. We see the particles directly, but we can also see the waves indirectly. What begins as a very small range of locations occupied by the photons 
ends up as a very large range of locations downstream, and this happens because the influence of the wave is fundamentally chaotic. According to the pilot wave interpretation, the direction of the path of the photon is actually determined prior to its interaction with the screen. And even though the direction of the photon is not predictable in practice, it is predictable in principle. The Copenhagen interpretation is the original quantum theory, and I would say that is the most compelling of the three. The many worlds interpretation is the most interesting interpretation, but it also lacks a certain parsimony. The pilot wave interpretation fits very well with common sense, but it doesn't fit very well with the experimental data. All three of these popular interpretations of quantum mechanics leave much to be desired. I should also add that while we call these interpretations of quantum mechanics, we should really be calling them theories, because that is really what they are. They're theories. But regardless of what we think is actually happening under the hood of this mysterious quantum mechanical machine, there are some things that we can all agree on. There really is a wave, and the wave really does move in all directions simultaneously, as waves do. But we can't see the wave directly. The wave is latent. The particle appears to move in a single direction, and we can see the collision site where the particle collided with the screen. The particle is manifest. According to the supervelocity and selection theory of light, the speed component of light's velocity vector is also in superposition. This means that the direction of the photon is a super direction, and the speed of the photon is a super speed, such that the velocity vector of the photon is a super velocity. This means that light is not a particle or a wave, but a super wave. When the latent superwave finally manifests as a photon, its direction will be selected randomly, and its speed will be selected according to the location of the observer in velocity space. So what this entails is that one way to misunderstand what a supervelocity is, is to assume that this speed component of the velocity vector must also be selected randomly, just as the direction component is. But that's not how this works. We do know what the relative speed of the manifest photon will be in advance, but only because we also know where the observer is in velocity space. The location of the manifest photon in velocity space depends on the location of the observer in velocity space. If the distance of a photon from the observer in velocity space is predictable in advance, then in what sense can we say that there is a probability of distribution? If there is no uncertainty, then why would we say that there is a range of possibilities? This is a very good question. One option is being selected from amongst several options. The location of the photon in velocity space still depends on the location of the observer in velocity space. It does not depend on the location of the source in velocity space. So in this case, to talk about possibilities means to think about how the observer could have occupied different locations in velocity space. Hence, rather than having a range of potential relative speeds, there is only one potential relative speed. But if we imagine that the observer could have occupied different locations in velocity space, then the observed photon would have also occupied a different location in velocity space. So again, the location of the photon can still be anywhere in velocity space, and this location in velocity space is not actually decided until the moment of observation. The velocity of the light is still observer-dependent, and it is still undefined until the moment of observation. So even though my use of terms like probability distribution, wave function, and superposition may lead one to assume that the speed will be determined randomly, I'm not claiming that the speed is determined randomly. The speed is determined by the observer and not by the source, because the location in velocity space would have been different if the observer had been in a different location in velocity space. It is also important to keep in mind that although a particular observer can only occupy one particular location in velocity space at a time, 
any location in velocity space also has room for an unlimited number of other observers. Everyone who is watching an event in a stadium will occupy the same location in velocity space, even though they each occupy different locations in space. In this sense, locations in velocity space are very different from locations in space because multiple observers cannot share the same location in space. The second principle that I apply here is the Huygens Fresnel principle, which says that light waves propagate in the form of expanding spheres from a source. We already understand the basic rules of optics intuitively, and we know that light from a point source does travel in all directions at once. Just imagine that you're in a dark room with one eye closed and that you can see a lit candle flickering about 10 meters away from you. All of the candlelight that you see would then be traveling in a straight line directly from the candle to your pupil. Because we understand the basic laws of optics at an intuitive level, we also understand that rays of light are extending out from the candle in all directions simultaneously. The rays of light that enter your pupil are relatively few in comparison to the many rays of light that are emanating from the candle. In other words, the rays that enter your pupil are manifest, while the rays that don't enter your pupil are latent. And even though you cannot see the latent light, you still know that it is there, because you know that you would still see the flickering candlelight no matter where you are in the room. Even though you don't see all of the light that the candle emits, you know that you could potentially see any of the light that the candle emits, and not just the light that you actually do see. The light that you do see is merely the tip of the iceberg. What I'm trying to do here is make reasoning about the speed of light just as intuitive as reasoning about the direction of light is. The basic laws of optics are intuitive because we have daily experience with them. The idea that the speed of light is constant just because the light that is seen always maintains a constant speed relative to the observer is just as naive and superficial as is the idea that the direction of light is constant just because the light that is seen is always pointed directly towards the observer. We recognize immediately that there is no real contradiction in the idea that the candlelight is traveling in multiple directions at the same time. And I say that we should also see no contradiction in the idea that the light from the candle is moving at multiple speeds at the same time. Just as all directions cannot be seen at one time by the same observer, all speeds cannot be seen at one time by the same observer. Just as all directions cannot be seen from one location in space, all speeds cannot be seen from one location in velocity space. The direction that the light that you observed moved in depends on where your pupil is. And if you know where your pupil is, and where the source is, then the direction of the observed light becomes predictable. But if you don't know where the pupil will be, then the observed direction of the light would be random because it cannot be predicted in advance. The direction of the observed light is determined by where the observer is. Similarly, the speed of the observed light is determined by where the observer is in velocity space. It doesn't matter that the light that is observed is always a constant distance away from the observer in velocity space, because as the observer moves in velocity space, the light also moves with them. Meanwhile, as the source moves in velocity space, nothing happens to the location of the observed light in velocity space. Any light that travels in directions that point away from the observer, or at speeds that are different from C relative to the observer, will never interact with the observer, and so it is not seen. And this light that is not seen is latent light. However, this candle analogy can also be somewhat misleading, because it may appear as though I am suggesting that there is actually much more energy in the environment than just the energy that we are aware of. To the contrary, I'm not claiming 
that there is an abundance of untapped energy that exists in the form of latent light. Rather, energy is conserved. So for every photon of energy that a source emits, a maximum of one photon of energy will be absorbed at a later time. There is no excess energy that is released, and so the principle of the conservation of energy is not actually violated. Latent light is merely potential, it's not actual. It is also important to note that the latent light which becomes manifest light does not depend on an arbitrary inertial frame of reference. It does not matter where we place the origin or the zero coordinates in velocity space. It does not matter what we consider to be stationary or motionless. All that matters is the location of the observer in velocity space, and the location of the observer does not need to coincide with the zero coordinates in velocity space. Latent light is potential, global, and continuous. Manifest light is actual, local, and discrete. A superwave is a multitude of directions and a multitude of speeds, but a photon only has one speed and one direction. The speed is predictable if you know where the observer is in velocity space, but the direction is random. Because it's nice to have a way to visualize what a superwave looks like, I've created an animation which shows a wave that is moving at three speeds at the same time. All three of these waves have the same frequency, but they have different wavelengths and different speeds. There is much more to light than meets the eye. To observe everything is to observe nothing. To observe something is to filter out everything else. There can be no observation without a corresponding selection process. What we see is really only the tip of the iceberg. Just to reiterate, it does not matter who or what we consider to be stationary. All that matters is the objective location of the observer in velocity space. If you think that the location of the zero coordinates in velocity space is what determines how the manifest light is selected, then you will get very confused very quickly. The zero coordinates are merely a property of the map not the terrain. In summary, manifest light is the light that can be seen because it's moving at C relative to the observer, and latent light is the light that cannot be seen because it's moving at a speed other than C relative to the observer. It is wrong to assume that manifest light is all of the light that exists just because it is all of the light that we can see from our particular location in velocity space. Now let's apply the idea of latent light to the light clock thought experiment. In the light clock thought experiment, an observer is in one location in velocity space, and the light clock is in another. What this means is that the light that is making the light clock tick cannot possibly be seen by the observer. Meanwhile, the light that the observer sees is not the same light that is making the light clock tick. Therefore, a light clock should not appear to slow down as it moves at a relativistic speed relative to an observer. The light clock is responding to one part of the superwave, and the observer interacts with a different part of the superwave. So once again, in summary, manifest light is just the tip of the iceberg, latent light is the whole iceberg, and confusion proliferates whenever we assume that the tip of the iceberg is all that there is to the iceberg. There are also two easy ways to misunderstand what latent light is. One way involves thinking that the speed of manifest light should be determined in an unpredictable manner, and the other involves concluding that latent light must violate the conservation of energy. In reality, the location in velocity space of manifest light is both variable and predictable but it is not determined until an interaction actually takes place. Before I wrap up this video, I want to point out that there is a similar concept in quantum field theory known as virtual photons. 
Virtual photons can be thought of as akin to latent light. These are photons which are never actually observed, and which may also move at speeds other than the speed of light. Whether or not virtual photons ought to be regarded as real is debatable, but it is interesting to note that there is already a strikingly similar concept that is well established in theoretical physics.